triumphalist version of Unitarian Universalist history. And while everything that she said is true, there's also a version of this history that is far less triumphalist. And so it's true. It is absolutely true that many Unitarians and Universalists in the early and mid-1800s were some of the most courageous uh, advocates for abolitionism, helping to advance that cause. And it's also true that many of the Unitarians living in New England owned factories, mills that took southern cotton, spun it, turned it into clothes, sent it all over the world, made a profit through the slave trade, the slave industry. It's true that Unitarians in the late 1800s, early 1900s, especially John Haynes Holmes, founded some of the most progressive organizations in our country, including having a role in founding the NAACP. And it's also true that there were Unitarians who were academics at Harvard and elsewhere who were the purveyors of racial pseudoscience that had a really devastating impact on our country. It's true that more Unitarian Universalist ministers, including Clark Olson, may he rest in peace, responded to King's call to come to Selma. And it is also true, it is also true that the records of local congregations at that time involve many African Americans who would be ministers and would be members but did not find support and were turned away rather than embraced. I say this history, this, this mixed history, and I will tell you that it gets me. I feel it in my gut. I get, I get defensive. I want to make excuses. I want to ignore it. I want to pretend it is true. I'm getting the heebie-jeebies right now. And it's that kind of reaction that I want to talk about a little bit. Marian uh, Hirsch, our Director of Religious Education, um, approached me in the fall and said, Tom, I want to preach, wanna, do, do you want to help preach a sermon about racism and, and white supremacy together? We got to talking a little bit about it, and then um, how it evolved was that it would be a two-part sermon that I would give the first part, sort of talk about a little bit of a foundation of, of white supremacy, and then uh, we would share the pulpit together and talk about some of the more constructive and positive um, possibilities. And so um, within, the next, within the next six weeks or so, we're going to find a date, and Marianne and I are going to share the pulpit, and we're going to do part two. But this morning, this morning is part one. It's 2019. It is 2019, and it is the 400th anniversary. This year is the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved persons arriving in the present-day United States. Kidnapped from Africa, brought across the Atlantic, held as property, imported, bought, and sold as commodities. The history, the history of these past 400 years can be broken down into eighths. Each eighth, each of the eight periods lasting 50 years. The first five eighths of this history is the period of slavery in the present day United States. The owning of people, the ownership of their labor, the ownership of their children and their children's children into perpetuity. We can look forward to the year 2111. 
Who's looking forward to 2111? <laughs> the year 2111 will mark the year that African Americans will have been free in the United States for as long as they were enslaved. My daughter will be 99 in 2003. So the first five-eighths of the past four centuries was the period of American slavery. The next two-eighths, the next century, literally a century from the end of the Civil War, 1865, to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, was marked by, this period was marked by systemic inequality <coughs> under the law, systemic legalized exclusion from the political process, and systemic legalized exclusion from education, housing, employment, banking, public accommodations, medicine, and from representation in the criminal justice system. So five-eighths slavery, two-eighths Jim Crow and systemic legalized exclusion, and the past one-eighth, the past five decades, what has this period been marked by? Craziness. <laughs> what has this period been marked by? It's an interesting question. It's been, it's been marked by, on one hand, the system of white supremacy, a system of racialized violence, racialized control, racialized privilege, finding ways to continue to perpetuate itself. Scholars like Michelle Alexander and Carol Anderson talk about this period as the new Jim Crow, in which the virus of white supremacy has mutated. It looks different, and yet it remains virulent and lethal. And these last five decades have also been marked by attempts to reckon with this legacy, to interrupt this legacy, to build a new way. I think one thing that is worth remembering is that if we're feeling like 50 years, the last 50 years hasn't accomplished all that much, and sometimes we feel that way, we need to hold that truth against the reality that it's 350 years of history beforehand. So where are we now? Where are we now? I want to talk about three levels of white supremacism. The first level is overt, explicit white supremacist racism that includes hate crimes and violent extremism. The second level is systemic. <laughs> systemic racism, this includes all of the systems that are set up to preserve and reinforce racial disparities and inequalities in education and health, income and wealth, employment, criminal justice, in terms of who suffers most from the impacts of climate change. There's explicit there's systemic, and then there is a kind of white supremacy that is cultural. This cultural white supremacy includes habits, behaviors, worldviews, and so forth that make confronting racism so uncomfortable and so fraught and serve to keep us from addressing, really addressing these realities. This is perhaps the hardest part to talk about because it is the least visible and also because it gets the closest to home. So this morning I want to talk about the overt, the systemic, and the cultural. And I need to begin by mentioning the overt. We are, after all, living in a time in which there has been a dramatic upsurge of open and overt white supremacist violence. A recently released report from the Anti-Defamation League shows that 2018 was one of the deadliest years in the last 50 for hate crimes. And in 2018, 100%, 100% of murders considered committed by extremists were committed by extremists with ties to right-wing groups. To quote from the report, extremist-related murders in 2018 were overwhelmingly linked to right-wing extremism. Every 
one of the perpetrators had ties to at least one right-wing extremist movement, white supremacists were responsible for the great majority of the killings, which is typically the case. We've seen overt white supremacism in the news in recent weeks. First, at an elite all-boys Catholic school in Kentucky, and then in the yearbook pages of a Virginia medical school in the 1980s. And what both of these incidents have in common is that what we see when we look at them are highly ritualized enactments, highly ritualized enactments of racialized mockery and humiliation as a form of white male bonding. The purpose of these rituals is to achieve racial solidarity. The schools that they come from, these are places of privilege. The graduates of these schools go on to become business executives, doctors, governors, and they do so highly socialized into an identity of racial superiority white solidarity and white bonding. I want to be clear about the link between the overt and the systemic. I gave a sermon here a year or so ago in which I mentioned a study out of the University of Virginia Medical School. The study dealt with people who sought medical care for a type of painful injury and the study dealt with whether or not they were treated with pain medicine. And the findings of this study showed that there was racial bias in the administration of pain medicine, that white people were treated with greater frequency and higher doses than people of color. And what the study suggested was that doctors were more likely to empathize with, feel bonded to, feel responsible for, more likely to listen and to believe white patients than brown patients. And we would ask why that, why that is. It's tempting to think, reassuring perhaps, to think that the fault lies with some subset of doctors, maybe the ones who appeared in their medical school yearbook pictures. I didn't even know medical schools had yearbooks. In their medical school yearbook pictures wearing blackface and clan hoods. However, that's probably not all of what's going on. There was another study done by the University of Virginia that studied children between the ages of five and 10, and what this study showed was that by the age of seven, by the age of seven, children had begun to believe that black children and white children experience pain differently. Children will listen. The takeaway from these studies, what studies like these demonstrate, is that racial biases actually do permeate our culture. And what the studies show is actually something that may be hard for many of us to hear, which is that Racial inequality is not just what's perpetuated by some subset of folks, but in fact, racial biases are something that permeate our entire society. If we could require every single person in this room to take a test, undergo a screening, participate in a study designed to measure our levels of racial bias, I believe that we would all, we would all register as having racial bias. And I don't want to hear from the statistics professors in the rooms who would certainly talk about standard deviations and distribution curves and so forth. But what all the studies I've seen and read show is that racial bias is operative in us that it begins at a young age, actually, that a um, professor from 
the School of Public Health talk, uh, talk, tell me between the services about a study that he done, had done with students here at UNC in which the study was, was actually on whether it was possible to interrupt racial bias. Interesting research. People who do anti-racism work have suggested that individualism is a cultural factor that makes it difficult to counteract systemic white supremacy. Individualism actually functions as a self-defense mechanism. So study after study shows bias, and individualism responds by saying, well, I have not been studied. I have passed that test. I have some personal virtue, some education, some personal experience, some part of my unique life story. I had a childhood friend, I went to an integrated school, I went to that march that makes me special and exempts me from this great cultural conditioning. It is, I think, more honest and more virtuous to respond by saying, that by virtue of the fact that I exist in the culture that I do, it is far more likely than not, in fact it is certain, that I have picked up on the cultural habits of white supremacy, including racialized biases, and therefore it behooves me to develop some self-awareness so that I can disrupt my own behaviors so as not to perpetuate racial inequity. As much as the news is discouraging, with hate crimes by white supremacists on the rise, with elected officials who proudly flaunt their connections with hate groups, with scandals, so many scandals, that are scandalous even though they are not surprising. There's one news story that I want to end with a news story that I think is hopeful. Hopeful in that it models the type of leadership and the type of reckoning that I think is necessary. This was a local news story from the past week. I read it uh, in the local paper. And, and what I liked about it was that it shows a different way, a different way of engaging with this both legacy and current reality of white supremacy. So the story was about this past Monday night when the board of the Orange County Schools unanimously passed the school system's first ever, ever racial equity policy. The first line of that policy reads as follows. The Orange County Schools acknowledges persistent racial intolerance, inequities, and academic disparities in our district. And it was interesting because the story went into kind of how hard that sentence was to write. And all of the debate over whether that sentence should be in the report or maybe it should find some way to kind of, to kind of say something a little, a little less hard, a little less difficult. Some members of the school board originally bought at this language, even though there was real concrete evidence that showed racial disparities in academic performance, in school discipline, and a host of other factors. What I like about this story is that even though it takes an injustice, is that it shows people who are able to actually sit in a room, overcome fragility, overcome shame, overcome all of the, the heebie-jeebies that come with owning that our past and our current has challenges, to actually name it with some honesty, and then in the rest of the policy, which details changes, investments, real tangible things that can be, be done to make, it, to make a difference. That's where I want to leave things today. With the hope that comes from honest reckoning, with owning 
things as they are, with the commitment to be honest about them, and the commitment to do something new, to build a new way. Amen. Blessed be, and I hope you come back for part two. And let's, uh, the hour is nigh, but we're going to sing our closing hymn. It is Circle Round for Freedom. It's a short hymn, so we're going to sing it to you twice. And I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing number 155.